Providence Presbyterian Church. Uh, we are glad we are all able to worship this day in a virtual way, uh, but it is uh, worship nonetheless. Uh, we welcome those uh, who may be visiting with us who are uh, worshiping as well. Uh, thank you for participating with us uh, in this service today. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Our session will be meeting uh, on Sunday the 17th at 1230. We'll have a Zoom meeting. Uh, please uh, uh, please join in. Uh, we need to discuss a lot of different things. Uh, one of those things is uh, when we might uh, be open uh, to gather again uh, for worship and how we might do that. Uh, it's going to be a lively discussion, I think. So please join in and, uh, and uh, we'll just see where we go. Um, would um, um, Law, do, do you have any announcements that, that you um, need to make? Just uh, Zoom Bible studies are available during uh, weekdays and Sundays as mm -hmm. well. So Monday, for example, Monday morning um, women's Bible study uh, members can join or Friday morning men's Bible study. And there are at least three um, Zoom Bible studies uh, on Sunday. So if members right. can join, friends can join. Please just contact us. Yeah, and that's during the Sunday school hour, right? Yep. Yeah, during Sunday school hour. Starting at 10 o'clock. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I, Law looks so good. I mean, I mean, look at this. His hair. I mean, I thought the barber shops and salons were closed. I mean, look. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding you. I know. He's just <laughs> perpetual youth here. Um, anyway. Gosh. Um, well, let me. Uh, uh, begin our service of worship with a call to worship. Be it the sun by day, or the stars and the moon by night, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, and yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. May we listen today for creation's praise of its maker, and may we join in that everlasting song as we worship the Lord of all. Jesus said, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. Let us pray. Great and loving God, your will for us in Jesus is the peace which the world cannot give, and your abiding gift is the advocate whom Jesus promised, calm our all troubled hearts, dispel every fear, keep us steadfast in love and faithful to your word, that we may always be your dwelling place. Grant this through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who lives with you now and always in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
of the morning psalm comes from Psalm 66. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of God's praise be heard. God has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. We have been tested and like silver tried. Over our heads did enemies ride. You led us, O God, through water and fire, beast of burden sinking in the mire. Yet, O God, you have brought us out to a spacious place. Come and hear all you who fear God. And I will tell what God has done. I cried aloud to God. And God listened to my plea. God has given heed to the words of our prayers. Blessed be God, for God has not rejected our prayers. God has not removed God's steadfast love from us. All the earth worships and sings glorious praises to God. Let us join in. C.S. Lewis wrote, Though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins or our indifference, and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to Him. Though we may feel wonderfully worthwhile, or totally worthless, or for most of us, most often, somewhere between two, the two, this does not define us. God's love does. We can then, in all the honesty we can muster, confess our shortcomings and sin, assured of God's prior decision to forgive. Friends, let us take a moment or two of silence for personal confession. Love is patient, love is kind. But we are not, O oh Lord. Patience is in short supply. The ever-increasing pace of life requires efficiency, and patience dies, taking kindness to the grave with it. Forgive us, Father, we have sinned. Love is not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. But we are, O oh Lord. We boast about our accomplishments, our kids, our self-sufficiency, our self-styled images, and more, as if it were all about us. Our self-centeredness rises to arrogance, fueling a rudeness to those who just don't happen to be us. Father, forgive us. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Forgive our insistence, either actively or passively, that it be our way or the highway. Forgive our terrible tendency to hold grudges, nurse resentments, and point the finger of blame without giving benefit of the doubt, or even listening for the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, holds all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
Heavenly Father, your love bears us. Your faithfulness secures us. Your future gives us hope. And your never-ending love brings joy to all we endure. In your mercy, keep us in your love, that we might become your love for all. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. God is rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love. So trust God's love in Christ and let that love abide in you, work through you, and change and transform you. For in God, we live and move and have our being. Amen. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine good, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them are your servants warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So let it be, O God, as we hear your word this day. Amen. The first reading of the scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, 
but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, our text today comes to you from the book of Acts, and it is one of uh, Paul's journeys. In fact, uh, he ends up in, uh, in Athens. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had a, a time of it here with the uh, pandemic and, and all of that and everything having to be done virtually. And I thought I needed to interject a note of realism. And so I have taken the pastor's slush fund and bought myself a, a ticket to Athens. And uh, here I am uh, to read you the text uh, from Paul's uh, trip to Athens. So uh, Paul has entered the city and he has noticed that it is full of idols. And so he has begun arguing with both the Epicureans and the Stoics uh, and he is trying to tell them a little bit about uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, they're not having uh, much of it and so what, what they do is they kind of round Paul up and they say, you need to tell us more about this. Come on over and um, to the Areop Areopagus, because uh, that is the place and that is the council that Paul needs to do his explaining before. So, Paul stands in front of the Areopagus and says, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For I went through the city, I looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you. The God who made the God who made the world and everything in it, He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor He made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and He allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of and the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or a stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. No, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord from Athens. Thanks be to God.
Children's Sermon, Providence Presbyterian Church, May 17, 2020, take 74. Hey kids, I'm glad you're here with me this morning. I hope everybody's doing well. I know you're not really here, you're at home. But we're here in spirit, thanks to our church putting these things together and Christ binding us all together. How's it going at home? Pretty tough? Yeah, maybe not so tough. Uh, I know some of you are probably thinking you'd like to get back to school, which you probably didn't think you'd ever want to do um, when all this started, and it's been a while, I know. Today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit sounds pretty complicated, but it's not as hard as it seems. Um, When Jesus left us to go back to be with God in heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He left us with something called the Holy Spirit, which is going to help us keep faith, uh, keep strong, keep together, and do the things that he's asking us to do, like love God and be nice to other people. So let's think about how it might go. If you were home, which you are right now, and let's just say you're parents were doing some homeschooling teaching uh, for you right now, which is happening in a lot of homes. And let's, for the older folks, um, let's go back to when we were doing the ABCs. And for the ones who were doing the ABCs, this is right for you right now. What if your mom taught you the A and the B and the C? So you knew ABC, but you didn't know any of the other 26. You hadn't gotten there yet. And then she said, hey, I've got to pop out to be with grandma in another town for a couple days. So while I'm gone, go ahead and learn the rest of the ABCs because that's what I want you to do. And when I get back, I'll expect you to know all of them. But she didn't leave you with anything to understand what the rest of the ABCs were. So you didn't know about D, E, and F and all the rest of it. Well, would your mom really do that? No, she wouldn't do that. And would that work? Probably not, because as hard as you tried, you really wouldn't be able to just come up with all that on your own. But your mom wouldn't do that, and neither would Jesus, because when he left us to go back to heaven, he left us with the Holy Spirit, because he knew that we would need help to do those things, like keep the faith and stay strong and be cheerful and to love him and think about him and do the things that he wants us to do, like being nice to other people. So um, it's just nice to know that we didn't get left on our own, we're not on our own, and that Jesus was thinking about us and left us the most powerful thing that's ever been known, uh, the Holy Spirit. So let's say a prayer. Uh, Dear Lord, Thank you for being our Savior, and thank you for everything you've done for us and continue to do for us and for protecting us and our loved ones. And thank you for leaving us with the Holy Spirit and help us to use it to do what you want us to do. Amen. Okay. Those of you that are four and under can go to the children's uh, church. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, you can't. Just go back to what you were doing. All right. Bye, everybody. Be good. Our second reading of Scripture comes from uh, the Acts of the Apostles. um, And this is uh, from chapter 17. I'll be reading from verse 22 through verse uh, 31. Uh, This is about Paul in Athens. Uh, He has... He has been run out of uh, Thessalonica and Berea, and uh, he has made his way over to Athens, um, where he is enjoying some degree of safety. Uh, He's waiting for um, uh, two of his friends, Silence and and Timothy, to join him. Uh, While he is there, he is noticing all of the different uh, idols, shrines to idols that are set up all over over the place and all over the city. and he is much distressed by this. And um, uh, he has some arguments with the Stoics and the Epicureans uh, about, about Jesus. Uh, and they're not quite sure what to make of it. 
And so they take him uh, and they say, listen, we're going to take you over to the um, Areopolis, Areopagus. Uh, and that was, uh, it was both a, a place and it was a council. And so he's probably appearing before this council um, and telling about what it is uh, that this new religion is what they think it is. And, and, and he he's, has to give an account of it. Well, as I continue my trip around uh, Athens, I have ended up in Mars Hill. And, and in Mars Hill, you can actually overlook, you can see the Parthenon and you can see the Acropolis. And I think this may have been the view that Paul had as he walked into the city. And he looked around and he, he began to see all of the idols that were there. And, and it really distressed him. And that's when he began to argue with the Epicureans and with the Stoics. And, and in one of his arguments, he said, you know, um, these, uh, God does not live in, in shrines made by human hands, perhaps referring to the Parthenon and the Acropolis. Well, that is a conjecture, I, I admit, but uh, it is uh, at, least a, uh, at least a possibility. Well, we are uh, uh, late for the flight back to the uh, U.S., so uh, I will be seeing you back in the sanctuary momentarily. So Paul is waiting in Athens for Silas and Timothy to join him. He looked about, and perhaps uh, starting from the perspective of Mars Hill, uh, from where he could see the Parthenon, the Temple of Athena, built on the Acropolis, where there were many other sanctuaries, temples, and shrines to the whole pantheon of gods and goddesses. Uh, looking out, he was quite distressed to see that the city was so full of idols, idols of silver and gold, wood and clay, with eyes, but they do not see, with ears, but they do not hear, mouths but cannot speak even nostrils but they don't breathe that's how the that's how the psalmist describes them the psalmist continues to say that that those who make them and those who worship them will become like them perhaps the existence of idols distressed paul less than what he knew the fate to be of those who worship them. Paul knew that bowing down to lifeless idols, uh, these Athenians would, would have the, their very life sucked right out of them. The worship of dead idols kills the spirit. And more positively, uh, Paul knew the life-giving presence of Christ and wanted these others to know this as well. The Spirit of Christ enlivened His Spirit and gave Him this life and gave it abundantly. These idols lead to nothing but death and death-dealing ways. Someone has put it this way, you are what you worship. John Calvin famously said, the human mind is a perpetual factory for idols. And we have our share of them today, don't we? What would Paul say if he turned up here today? Would he be deeply distressed that the city is so full of idols? Shrines built for our financial institutions representing both the prosperity and the security we hope to gain from them. We trust them to hold the coin and currency on which we printed, in God we trust, which is true so long as we're talking about the money being our God. Paul might notice the glowing shrines in our homes that keep us mesmerized and entertained and informed. These gods we can manipulate with the push of a button on the remote. Then there are the handheld portable shrines we must have and serve in order to stay in constant communication and to find the answer to just about anything except uh, why we are here and what meaning is there to our lives and to this world. Surely Paul would notice us bowing to the classic three idols of all ages, power, prestige, and possessions. He might catch us offering sacrifices to the goddess efficiency as we post our to-do list on her altar 
and pray for her blessing of multitasking so that we might accomplish it all in the little time our busy lives seem to have. The great God progress measures our advancement toward the heaven of our own making in bits and bytes, ones and zeros, and also in dollar signs and stock market increases and so many other ways. The more we have, the more progress we have made. Is that the equation that counts in life? Paul was good at recognizing idols. Sometimes the tools we use as means become ends in themselves. And Paul would see this as idols in the making. Technological advancement has become almost an end in itself. Perhaps through advancements in artificial intelligence, we will actually create a God. Or maybe through the correct combination of capitalism and socialism and consumerism and patriotism and realism, we will create the perfect society. What would Paul say to us as he gazed upon the shrines with steeples and stained glass, and even those without them? Shrines built to hold a very dangerous and powerful God for fear that if this God were loose, we would find ourselves at his or her mercy rather than this God being dependent on ours. Oh, the idols we set up in hopes of controlling life as if life were meant to be controlled. And let us also admit that it is usually other people's lives that we like to control even more than our own. But life is meant to be lived. And no matter how many idols we enshrine, no matter how often we bow to them and sacrifice for them, there is always something missing, something more. We never seem to get it all together, do we? Now the Athenians were at least curious about what they lacked, about what was missing, about the more. They were always searching, always on the lookout for something new. And what Paul was speaking of was certainly new. And so they took him to the university lecture hall where the Areopagus Council gathered to hear lectures and presentations and have discussions and sometimes even pass judgment. Several centuries before Paul, Socrates had been brought to this very same Areopagus in much the same manner as Paul. Socrates' speech led to his death. So suspense is building. Luke, the writer of Acts, may be presenting Paul as a sort of Christian Socrates. Would Paul's speech get him killed? Paul's speech and it is truly a great speech, a clever argument, a subtle way of coming in these intellectuals' back door to present the God who is Lord over all, the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Paul even brings in quotes from some of their own philosophers. Paul has seen how extremely religious they are. So many gods. Perhaps they just didn't want to miss one Sort of like the fellow who joined 19 different churches, two synagogues, studied Buddhism and got a master's degree in comparative religion, who, would, who said, I just wanted to cover all the bases. The Athenians did. They even had an altar to the unknown God, unless they missed one. Paul uses this as a crack in the door, and he tells them that he knows this unknown God, and he'd be happy to tell them. This is the God who made the world and everything in it. This is the God who is Lord of heaven and earth. And consequently, this God cannot live in shrines made by human hands. We are the unknown God's handiwork, not vice versa. We don't make God. We can't manipulate God, handle God, or control God like the Athenians do, like, like we do. In all of these shrines where we bribe the gods, or seek to appease them in one form or another. God doesn't need anything from us. In fact, God 
gives all. All nations spring from one ancestor, which this God made, which this God made to happen. This God made all nations, that is, all races. And the gist of Paul's argument here is that God does not make any ultimate distinctions between one race of humans and another. What we today call racism is not of God. And there is a purpose. So that all would search for God, perhaps grope for God, and find God. For God is not far from each one of us. And here Paul quotes one of their poet philosophers. In Him we live and move and have our being. And then another quote. For we too are His offspring. The unknown God wants to be known. The story about a boy who lost a dog in New York City. And as he walked up and down the streets systematically and slowly, a friend complained that he wasn't even looking for the dog. He answered, I'm not looking for him. I'm letting him find me. Sooner or later, he will discover the trail I am putting down and follow it until he comes to me. God has been putting down a trail ever since the creation of the world. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament does proclaim God's handiwork. And Paul uses that very argument in Romans to show how we have no excuse for not knowing, not believing that this God exists. The whole of salvation history as presented in the scriptures is God laying down a trail so that we will find Him. And this God who, who calls Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, this God who, who leads these folks because He wants to save the world through them, this God who rescues His people from Egypt, this God who delivers them with a mighty hand and cares for them and takes them through the wilderness 40 years and into the promised land. This God is laying down a trail for us. This God who on Mount Sinai gives the scriptures, gives the Torah, gives the instructions, if you will, for living and for living as God's people. God's people who are blessed to be God's people, but also to be a blessing to the world so that every family in the world will be blessed through them. This God who continues to be with His people even as, they, even as they have kings and then the kings turn bad and He delivers prophets so that the prophets can warn the people and chastise the, the, chastise the kings and the hierarchy who are not following in God's ways. And even when God allows this people to be conquered and exiled, God is still with them and promises to bring them back and promises that from this people, one will come. One will come. A Messiah. A Savior. Yes, God wants to be known. And God has laid down a trail for us to follow so that we might find Him. And God has overlooked our, our inability to find Him and our searching in every other trail except the one that He has laid down. And now, in Christ, He has come. Come as judge, to be sure. But this is the judge who comes to give life to the world. This is the judge who comes not to condemn, but in order to save. God comes in Jesus and says, Here I am. I'm right here. Hide and seek is over. For this, in the seeking now is the finding. God wills it so. Listen to what He says through the prophet Jeremiah. When you search for Me, you will find Me. If you seek Me with all your heart, I will let you find Me, says the Lord. Yes, God desires to be found and to be found in the person of His Son, Jesus. In a way, it's a sort of reverse hide and seek. When I was uh, doing junior high ministry many, many, many years ago, 
Um, well, we used to um, play a game every once in a while. We called it sardines. And it was a reverse hide and seek. One person would go out and hide. And then everybody else would go out and look for that person. And if you found that person, if you found them, instead of yelling, oh, here he is, over here, come here. No, you would slip in and hide with that person. The rest of the people are still looking. And then maybe another one finds those two and they slip in and hide. And then another one, and then another one. And it just keeps going like that until, until the little space where that person's hiding is getting crammed full of all of these junior high kids. And Well, it was just a lot of fun. But it sort of reminds me of maybe the way God is working in the world today and certainly the way God is working in the church. For God is out there. God has laid down a trail. God has come forth in His Son. There's so many clues. And when we in the church find where God is, we jump in there with God. Yes! And we snicker a lot. And we laugh a lot. And pretty soon other people start hearing and other people start finding as well. And it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And maybe that's how God grows the church. Well... The good news is, God wills to be found. Well, I'll conclude, as the great seminary professors tell us to do, with a poem. The title of this one is called, No God Left Unaltered, and that's A-L-T-A-R-E-D. No God Left Unaltered. And this is a poem that was discovered not too long ago. Um, it's a very ancient story from, from Athens, Greece, uh, about the time that Paul visited there. Um, and um, tells a little bit of the story of, of Paul's visit and Paul's speech. Uh, hear these words. There's no God left unaltered in our time. Each one we can think of has a shrine. If your sacrifice goes unheeded, or one God refuses what's needed, then move on to the next one in line. For love to Aphrodite make please. At her temple your passion will increase. A Hugh Hefner design in full relief so sublime, and if you don't get excited, you're deceased. From goddess Athena comes our name. Wisdom and warfare are her fame. Born in Zeus's head, she wears armor to bed, driving romantics among us insane. For war, you need Ares by your side, son of Zeus and Hera, their pride. If it's bloodshed you're after or chaos and disaster, then a sacrifice to Ares is advised. A pretty young man with long hair, the life of the party extraordinaire. Dionysus, the god of wine, should be invited every time, and your bash will be the envy of the debonair. No one wants to be dead, so to Hades you must give some cred. That you are among the living, still breathing, now giving sacrifices so you don't die in bed. Hera is the wife of Zeus. For his affairs there's no excuse. Though she is the goddess of marriage, hers was a total miscarriage, but she still might help yours from coming loose. Zeus is king on Olympus. He could make your fate momentous, but pass his shrine by and most surely you will die. His lightning bolts are accurate and plenteous. But there is one God we don't know, still a shrine we built to bestow, a modicum of honor, lest Athens be a goner, and we would end up eating crow. Now this fellow shows up named Paul. About this God, we don't know, tells all. But while most don't get it, his words to his credit echo our poet's most eloquent call. We live and move and have being in this God who with our lives is weaving a tapestry of love, pure gift from above. Now children, we are all in God's keeping. Sounds mighty good to be sure. The God we don't know is the cure. To our angst and seeking, 
to give purpose and meaning, but talk of resurrection caused a stir. Some scoffed while others said, we'd like to hear more, wrap our heads around this strange concept. We'll put you on the docket. But he left and went to Corinth instead. Amen. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Risen Lord, we thank you for your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Today we pray for all who search for you. May they find their way in you. Lord, bless us with lips that sing your praise and lives that, that tell the stories of all that you have done for us. Open our eyes to find you among us as we share your love with others. Bless us with the joy for justice and the strength to preserve as we work toward your coming reign. We pray for all who hunger, and we pray for all who have lost their jobs, and those who worry each day how they will care for their families. Bless us all with meaningful work, and fill us with good things as we love and care for each other and find our sustenance in you. Lord, we don't know what will bring, the future will bring to us. We don't know when life will be normal again. We don't know when businesses and schools will reopen. But we know that you love us. We know that you are with us. Lord, give us courage and hope Bless us with your vision of peace. Bless us with the gift of faith that we may know you and love you and enjoy life eternal shared with you. These things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying together, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen friends god the divine giver gives us with life and breath and all that is in gratitude let us offer our gifts in return for the goodness and grace of God in Christ. Let us give our tithes and offerings to the good Lord. of faith today comes from 1st John chapter 4 beloved let us love one another because love is from God everyone who loves is born of God and knows God whoever does not love does not know God for God is love we believe that God's love was revealed among us in this way God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but we believe that if we love one another, God lives in us and God's love is perfected in us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, God has heard you and given heed to your prayers. Therefore, go in peace to serve Christ and always be eager to do what is good. May God who creates redeems and sustains, keep you steadfast in faith, buoyant in hope, and abounding in love. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.